Okay, hi everyone, and um, welcome to part two of this lecture on the nervous system. So, in the last lesson, um, we talked a little bit about uh, the synapse, which is the space between the end of a neuron here, the space here, uh, and the next neuron or the effector cell. So, uh, in the context of what we're looking at within this module, uh, this postsynaptic cell here will be a, a muscle cell or muscle fiber. Okay, so the synapse here is a space in between the two. Um, and we have two types of synapse, but the one that we're going to focus on is a chemical synapse. So as we learned in the last lesson, uh, our action potential is going to be generated at the axon hillock. It's going to travel down the axon to these presynaptic terminals. So this is a presynaptic terminal here. The black arrows represent the flow of information. And when they do that, they cause... Um, these ion channels to open and calcium enters. And what that does is it signals um, these vesicles here, which are like little envelopes, which contain something called neurotransmitters. And these vesicles then fuse with the plasma membrane and they release their contents, these neurotransmitters, out into the synapse. And the purpose or function of these neurotransmitters is to bind to these uh, receptors on these ion channels on our postsynaptic cell, so on our muscle cell. Um, so the only neurotransmitter that I want you to be aware of in this module is actually acetylcholine, because this is the neurotransmitter specific uh, to the receptors on the muscle cell. And what they do there is they open these ion channels, and they are sodium channels, and effectively sodium is concentrated outside the cell, so it then moves into the cell, causing depolarization of the muscle cell. We get a, an action potential within the muscle cell, uh, and that uh, initiates uh, a series of events which uh, result in contraction. Uh, we've learned this in other lectures um, around where the action potential passes down through the T-tubules, which is linked to the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which allows release of calcium, and calcium binds to troponin, removes tropomyosin blocking, uh, allows myosin and actin interaction and a cross bridge to be formed. So that's referring back to some of the lectures we looked at earlier in the semester. So the only neurotransmitter that I want you to focus on here is, is acetylcholine. I want you to remember that one. Okay, acetylcholine, what it does is it binds to uh, nicotine. It's ionotropic. And binding acetylcholine, ACH for short, allows sodium and potassium uh, to move uh, through their various ion channels and that causes uh, depolarization or what we have in short here is an EPSP an excitatory postsynaptic potential so it excites the skeletal muscle cell um, and initiates effectively a muscle contraction okay at this point I'll refer you to an, another YouTube video and I'll copy the, the link to this video um, uh, onto Solus for you Okay, so now we're going to uh, take a, a different approach. We're going to look at the central nervous system, and then we're going to look a little bit at the peripheral nervous system and what it's broken down into. So as we spoke about in the last lesson, um, the central nervous system consists of both the brain uh, and the spinal cord. So just a little bit about the spinal cord. It's located inside the vertebral column. Uh, it integrates reflex activity independent of the brain. So we've all heard of reflexes. Some of those reflexes, uh, the information passes back to the central nervous system only as far as the spinal cord, and then we get a quick response. Um, so people have he heard of the kind of patellar uh, tap test where um, you tap with a hammer, uh, the patellar on the knee, uh, and you see an automatic kick out of the leg. That's a reflex response, and that would be totally coordinated through the spinal cord. Uh, the spinal cord conducts voluntary signals to the effector organs, and the effector organ that we're interested in in this module is skeletal muscle. Uh, but it also relays information from the sensory organs back to the brain. So our afferent pathways, so information going back to the brain, enters through this dorsal root, Okay, and that's the, the flow of information. So these are neurons going back to the spinal cord here. And then our efferent pathways exit through the ventral root. Okay, so through through this aspect here, through the ventral root and down to the, to the muscle. So sensory information goes back this direction and efferent 
information out to the affected organs of skeletal muscle goes in this direction. Okay, uh, here we are going to briefly look at a few areas of the brain and their function, uh, focusing mostly on which areas of the brain are involved in motor planning and movement, which are the key focuses within this module. So first here in the bottom, we have what we call the brain stem. So in the overall brain, that's this area here. Okay, and that brain stem is made up of the medulla oblongata, the pons, okay, which is a kind of a bridge between the medulla oblongata and the mesencephalon. So pons is the French for bridge, and it might be an easy way of uh, remembering that. Um, collectively, uh, these three areas, uh, their function is to relay and process sensory information to other parts of the brain via interneurons, which are totally housed within the central nervous system. And in these other areas, decisions and actions on this information, this sensory information, so that's your visual information, your auditory information, your touch, feel, go back to these other areas, okay, such as the thalamus and hypothalamus, okay. The next area we're going to look at is the cerebellum. Um, it's uh, involved in coordinating complex uh, movement patterns, and it particularly helps to smooth out movement. And we'll look at that again in, in a little bit more detail in a moment. And the last areas that we're going to look at are what we call the midbrain, which consists of the th thalamus, hypothalamus, and the cerebrum. And again, we'll look at these in a little bit more uh, detail now. So in these areas, we act upon a lot of the sensory information that's been relayed uh, back to the brain. So if we take the, the cerebrum and we look specifically at the cerebral cortex, which again is involved in motor planning. So planning of movements, coming up with a program of movement, initiating contractions. The cerebral cortex is this area on the outside of the brain here. Okay. And what you're looking at is it's this area that gives the brain its, its shape that we kind of know with a series of folds. And the reason why we have these folds is actually to pack as many neurons as we can into the available space. So the skull gives us a structure, it gives us an available space, but the more neurons we can pack into this space, effectively, the, the smarter that we are. So in the cerebral cortex, um, there are roughly a billion neurons, and within that then there's about a trillion uh, synapses, so connections to, to other neurons. Uh, the sulcus and, and gyrus are the two areas which allow these, uh, I guess, allow us to maximize the volume um, that we can get into in, into the cranium. Um, so the sulcus are the folds or these um, hollow pieces and the gyrus are these uh, ridges here on top. And again, all these folds allow us to maximize the number of neurons that we have in the available space. Okay, if we look at the thalamus, um, what we have is a cluster of subcortical uh, nuclei located in the diencephalon. So all sensory information travels to the thalamus and to the cerebral cortex, with the exception of smell. So our sensory information comes to the brain stem. It's then relayed to the thalamus. And then the thalamus relays that to the cerebral cortex. And that helps make our, our, our motor plan. So here we filter and refine all the sensory input. And we make decisions based on that. And then the plan is formed in the cerebral cortex. In the hypothalamus, um, its key function is to regulate autonomic responses. So these are not conscious responses. These are things which are regulated autonomically. So things like your blood pressure, your heart rate, uh, your breathing rate, uh, and digestion. Not, not decisions that you make consciously. Things that happen automatically. The cerebellum, which we mentioned earlier, okay, its function is to adjust postural muscles. And it, it rapidly uh, automated adjustments to maintain our balance and equilibrium. So even if you're standing still, you might think you're not contracting any muscles. Actually, there is a number of serial, mini, small contractions happening. You're constantly uh, imbalanced as such, but these uh, postural muscles contract to keep you balanced. And the cerebellum is heavily involved in that. And then the second thing which the cerebellum is very important for is fine-tuning conscious and subconscious movements. So if you think of a, a, a complex movement, um, such as running, okay, there are a contraction of a lot of different muscles in a specific order within that. 
if I asked you to consciously think about contracting each of those muscles in that given sequence, you would have a very clunky movement. It would almost be robotic-like. Um, however, when you go and perform a running activity, um, you do this very seamlessly. It's very, very smooth. And that's actually done um, and facilitated through the cerebellum. Uh, the basal nuclei are a large group of subcortical, so subcortical meaning below the cortex of nuclei that participate in the control of movement. Um, they provide feedback to the cortex for the planning of motor strategies and they also contribute to this um, smoothing out of movement. Uh, the key areas are the caudate nucleus, putamen and globus pallidus. So our cortex comes up with a motor plan um, it refers this plan by the basal nuclei, which checks in with the thalamus where our sensory information is being relayed. That feeds back into the plan, and maybe either reaffirming the motor plan or changing it slightly based on some visual information maybe that we've received or some um, touch or feel that we, we, we received back. And then eventually uh, the uh, cortex um, initiates uh, the movement pattern uh, and we have contraction of skeletal muscles. Okay, the cerebellum all the while is feeding back into this loop, helping to smooth out that particular movement pattern. So voluntary movement looks something like this. First, we come up with an idea. What's the movement that we want to make? Okay, so um, if we think of maybe a games player, they maybe want to make a pass. All right, so that would involve if it's football. Um, contraction of the lower of the muscles of the lower limb in a specific way and to weight that pass so we come up with the idea of what we want to do uh, the limbic system which is involved in emotions also feeds in here how do we feel about this is this a safe pass is this a risky pass okay then we come up with the program so the primary motor cortex and the motor cortex being in, in the cerebrum uh, comes up with the program in the premotor area and uses supplementary motor areas uh, to supplement uh, that particular program plan. We then begin to execute the movement. Um, so uh, signals are sent down to the pyramidal and extrapyramidal tracts down to the motor neuron. So the motor neuron innervates directly to the muscle. We have movement of skeletal muscle. But even during that movement then, we've got lots of feedback. So our sensory systems are feeding back, you know, uh, visually, we're looking to see maybe is another player uh, looking to intercept the pass? Um, has the player we intended to pass to moved? So therefore, do we need to alter the program? Uh, the cerebellum is all the while uh, feeding back into the execution, helping to smooth out the movement. Uh, information is being relayed through the thalamus back to the motor cortex to come up with that idea, the basal nuclei and the brainstem okay so all the time we're feeding back throughout the movement so we've often made a decision to make a pass in a game but then mid movement actually stopped or put extra weight on the pass based on information that we've received back and this constant feedback loop uh, helps us to do that okay so this loop allows the central nervous system to make adjustments or even change the idea or intention so as to ensure a smooth execution of the task. Okay, so in the next piece, we're gonna, that was the central nervous system, we're gonna focus now on the peripheral nervous system. So we know that the central nervous system contains the brain and spinal cord and all the interneurons that are housed within this ENS. But the peripheral nervous system then is made up of afferent neurons, um, which uh, project into the central nervous system, bring sensory information from the external environment back to the central nervous system, and then efferent neurons, which take info from the central nervous system out to the effector organs. And again, I repeat, uh, the one that we're interested in here is skeletal muscle. So if we divide up the peripheral nervous system, it's uh, divided into the somatic nervous system. Um, and so one, or sorry, one of the divisions is the somatic nervous system. So the somatic nervous system only has one effector organ, and that is skeletal muscle. And again, that's the one we are most interested in in, in this module. So here's our typical neuron structure, our dendrites, our soma, our cell body, uh, a long projection axon, uh, directly speaking to the skeletal muscle. So this here will be known as a, a motor neuron. So one effector organ, skeletal muscle only, and its only function is the support of movement. 
it's often um, sometimes referred to as the voluntary nervous system um, because these contraction of skeletal muscles is typically voluntary. So it only consists of motor neurons, um, a motor neuron and the fiber that it innervates. So if this is one motor neuron, and these are all the different fibers that you can see its presynaptic terminals are speaking to, uh, that would be considered one motor, neur motor unit. So a motor neuron plus all the fibers it innervates are a single motor unit. And every time this neuron fires, all of these muscle fibers will contract. So this whole entire motor unit will contract. And um, we also have divisions of the uh, peripheral nervous system into the autonomic nervous system. And the autonomic nervous system is further divided into the uh, sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems. So the autonomic nervous system innervates all effector organs and tissues in the body except skeletal muscle. So we have the somatic nervous system, which is skeletal muscle only, and then the autonomic nervous system, which is everything else in the periphery outside of the central nervous system. So things like cardiac muscle, smooth muscle, glands, adipose tissue. And again, its main function is to maintain homeostasis, which we referred to earlier in the module. It's autonomic as it functions on a subconscious level. So these are not conscious decisions that you're making. So therefore, it's often referred to uh, opposite to the somatic nervous system as the involuntary nervous system. And it's further broken down into two divisions, the parasympathetic and the sympathetic. So as we mentioned in class um, and in earlier uh, lectures, uh, the sympathetic nervous system is often known as the fight or flight system. OK, and it generally um, facilitates changes in uh, from homeostasis uh, to facilitate fight or flight. So uh, increased mobilization of nutrients, increased heart rate, increased breathing rate. The parasympathetic nervous system then usually does the opposite or it's mostly opposite. It's most active during rest and digestion and its effects on um, organ uh, and systems are mostly opposite to the sympathetic nervous system. So in the case of heart rate, if the parasympathetic nervous system is more active than the sympathetic, then your heart rate will slow down, your breathing rate will slow down, allowing for rest uh, and digestion. Okay, so the sympathetic nervous system, just a little bit more detail, it responds in crises, fight or flight. Also very active during exercise and physical activity. Okay, increased alertness, increased cardiovascular and respiratory activity to facilitate movement and exercise, mobilization of energy resources to, to facilitate movement and exercise. The parasympathetic nervous system then on the other hand is active during rest. It allows for relaxation. So it slows down the cardiovascular and respiratory systems. It allows digestion and absorption of nutrients, so it stimulates the digestive organs. Okay, and this final slide here is just a review slide, uh, just to review the kind of overall structures of the nervous system. So here on top, we have the central nervous system. Okay, sensory information is going back through, this would be an afferent neuron. This side here would be efferent neurons. So we have uh, receptors here feeding sensory information back to the central nervous system. Uh, the central nervous system is making decisions on these. So uh, something like a, a decision being made in the motor cortex, a program for movement, uh, speaking out to the muscle via the somatic nervous system, straight to skeletal muscle. Okay, so here's our voluntary or somatic nervous system. And then here on the right is our autonomic or involuntary nervous system. Uh, further divided into the parasympathetic and sympathetic divisions. Sympathetic division involved in fight or flight, um, very active during exercise, okay? Uh, increasing contraction of cardiac muscle, for example, increasing heart rate, mobilizing energy resources. The parasympathetic uh, division, very active during rest and digestion. Speaking to all different organs, every other organ in the body, the parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system speak to other than skeletal muscle which is solely confined to the somatic nervous system. Okay, hope you enjoyed that. Um, and if you have any questions, uh, please ask me on the discussion boards. Thank you.